What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to the Celtics Pod. Happy Friday. Now, a little bit different. There's no Will today. Will's been busy with work. So I've got a pinch hitter, and it's probably the best pinch hitter you could ever ask for. Um, I'm always super happy when I get to speak with him. Somebody I consider a friend after this long working together and kind of going back and forth, bouncing ideas off. If you don't know by now, it's Mr. Keith Smith. How are you doing today, Keith? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me, man. That was a very kind introduction, so I'll take it. It's all the truth, man. It's all the truth. Now, we wouldn't be doing our job. Well, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't basically design this episode simply for trade discussions. You don't get a, a salary cap expert like yourself on a show very often, so it's best to kind of lean into that and just go full force. So that's what we're going to do. Before we do that, anybody that is watching on YouTube, make sure you can see Keith's YouTube channels in his um in the background, uh, just here, the NBA front office. If you are, if you're finding this for the first time, make sure to go check out Keith's channel. Him and his buddy Trevor do a great job there. And if you're here and you know you haven't hit that subscribe button already, make sure to do that too. So Keith, you wrote a piece. What was it yesterday at this point? Uh, the trade deadline primer for Celticsblog.com. When people listening should know who Celtics Blog are by now. And if they don't, they're not really Celtics fans. So you've kind of wrote this down into some I, I think this is the way you've done it's really well done. You've got the untouchables, and one of those two untouchables isn't necessarily untouchable, right? Would you agree with that? It's kind of the untouchable and the untouchable ish. And yeah, then... I think that's completely fair. It, it's that, how I approach it is very few players in the NBA are untouchable. If you ask the kind of average fan or took a cross section of fans, you're going to get a list of probably 30 to 40 untouchable players. And in reality, that list is probably more like four or five around the entire league. Now, there are players who it would take everything under the sun to get them, but that by definition means they're not untouchable. And I think for the Celtics, that's Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. And I think Jason Tatum is really close to being untouchable. Um, and then I think Jalen Brown's like a tier below. Now it's not, you call Brad Stevens. He doesn't hang up the phone on you. I, I kind of doubt he hangs up the phone on anybody. He's too polite and too nice of a guy to do that, but he's not going to hang up the phone and be like, idiot. Um, if you ask about Jalen Brown, but he's going to be like, all right, you better be ready to give me players and picks and everything else. They're very high on them. Um, this is you, you know, you cover the team just like I do. The story of the year is can these guys play together? Should they trade them? Should they not? The reality is they can play together. I had someone from the team tell me just the other day in a league where everyone is looking for wings that can play on both ends of the floor. We have two young ones under contract for a while. Why would we ever break that up? And I think their belief is the problems exist around Tatum and Brown. Not that they're perfect players, but those are the other things. And that's why I put them in that same group uh, right there is kind of the, it's probably not happening unless there's a major, major reset coming uh, that involves a whole bunch of stuff headed Boston's way. So one of my big questions is that I've kind of, spent too long asking myself uh, postulating is the word of my week at the moment so one of the things i spent too long postulating is are the celtics already on the clock in terms of you know that you've still got these guys under contract but that you need to give them a reason to already be envisioning themselves re-signing re a future deal or you know opting out and signing another long-term contract and to me trade deadlines like this when the team is struggling, when everything isn't happening the way you want it to, they matter because a player will look back and they will either think that you did everything possible to put them in a winning situation or that you dragged your heels and cost them opportunities to be successful. Now, that's my train of thought. Would you kind of, do you see this as one of those trade deadlines where Boston need to make a move because Jace, um, Tatum and Brown could potentially look back on this as a defining moment in any decision they make? I, I agree with your premise of being on the clock. I don't know that I agree with the time horizon as far as it needing to be this trade deadline. I think this trade deadline is, I just don't know that they need to do anything right now. Um, it's also hard to make those big mass moves. It's pretty rare that we see an in-season trade that involves superstars or multiple superstars. That generally is an off-season thing because rosters are bigger. You have more flexibility. It's just easier to do those things uh, after the season is over or before the next season starts. I, 
I do agree though that I think the two the Celtics are a little bit on the clock with these guys. And it feels maybe a little weird because they're they're younger players that are in the midst of their second deal. But but the reality is these guys up until last year have known nothing but winning until they got into the NBA. They they just, you know, uh Jalen Brown was part of a the Eastern Conference finals team. Tatum was his rookie year. Then 2019 went a little sideways, but they still won around in the playoffs. And then they won and went to the final or East Finals in the bubble. Uh and arguably maybe should have you know, got to the finals or maybe even won the championship had they been healthier uh, at that point. And then last year, things kind of went sideways on them. And that's where it is. That was their first kind of, all right, life isn't this easy in the NBA. You don't just continually make these playoff runs every single year. And then this year, it's been bumpy as the team has really, for the first time, reset around those two guys. So I do think you're on the clock from the idea of, you muddle through another 500 season next year uh, when Brown is halfway through his, his contract extension Tatum's uh, moving into to, to the second year of his, you're going to start to get questions of where are we going with this? What are we doing with this? And you have to be ready to answer those. I just don't know that it's right now, but, it, but you're, you're always on the clock with, with players once they get to that second deal, because the control shifts from the player to the team or from the team rather to the player in a major, major way. And that's fair. I mean, even if it was something for me personally, even if it was something as simple as a, a tweak or two around the fringes, a new a new role player coming in, just to say to these guys like, "Hey, we ha- we have a vision, and mm-hmm. we're just slowly putting the pieces to the puzzle." That because yep. uh, you know yourself, a role a decent role player can be the difference between three or four close game losses to three or four close game wins, and yep. I think that that's exactly what they're missing right now is just more trustworthy role players that they can really lean into and know that they're going to play the game the right way. Yeah, I agree completely. And I think we're seeing Ime Udoka because their roster is kind of limited on that. We've really seen over the last week, he started to cut the rotation down. Now, some of that was out of necessity from guys being out for a while, but I think they almost stumbled into Hey, maybe we're a little bit better when we only play eight guys. Uh, and that's, that's, you know, I've got my eight I can trust and I'm going to run with them. And that's, that's going to be how it is. And I think, you know, everybody else, we might go to the ninth or 10th guy, but it's going to be for less than 10 minutes a night where we're just going to slot them in as needed when somebody needs a little rest or we need a little, you know, burst of energy or whatever it is. So I think they now are in that position. The problem is, I don't know that those, the guys two through nine ish or two through eight behind Tatum and Brown are really fully good enough to say, yeah, we're good. We've got the eight or nine guys. I think you want to upgrade. The the good news is they have the ability to go and do that. And that's, that's why I think these next three weeks trade deadlines, four weeks from today is where we're recording this. I'm going to say the next three weeks, you want to hit trade deadline week with a really good idea of who are we? Where are we going? What team are we trying to be uh, the rest of the way? And I think they'll know that if, if they continue to kind of muddle along and they're this 500 team, hey, three weeks from now, you can feel a lot better about saying, all right, not that it's got to be Tatum or Brown, but let's move out some of the vets. Let's free up minutes for the kids. We're going to the, the last 30 odd games or so. We're just going to make them developmental games. If we make the play in great, if we don't, we don't, it is what it is. If you play really well over the next few weeks and they're, I know people don't want to hear this, but they're showing signs of figuring some some stuff out. I think they've won five of their last seven now. Uh, they've, they've started to play better basketball. I think we, if that continues, then you see trades made differently because then it becomes, all right, let's go get somebody. Let's get somebody to boost us up. Let's get somebody to help us make a playoff run. Okay. And, and like, do. The- Okay, so I'm gonna I've stumbled over my words. So we're gonna we're looking at this team that's you know they they found a way to they found a winning formula or they found the the building blocks of what could potentially be a winning formula, and we move on to the second part of your trade primer, which has a couple of these guys that one of them hasn't never played last night, and uh, you know you get your detractors like Marcus Smart didn't play and they played well. Who would have thunk it? And then you get other people like, hey, it was just a byproduct. You have Robert Williams in there as a hard to move and Josh Richardson in there as a hard to move. Now, obviously, Smart being 
who Smart is to the team and who he is to a large percentage of the fan base, you can understand why he's hard to move outside of his contract. Robert Williams, to me, is one of the more valuable members on this rotation. I think that if you were to move on from Robert Williams, it's with him as part of a package for a superstar. I don't think you should include him anything other than that personally. And Josh Richardson, to me, is a guy that I think would be a very, very valuable throw in on. Uh, I wouldn't call it a superstar trade, but, you know, a bigger trade than just, mm -hmm. hey, let's take another role player back, unless it's an elite role player. And their, their contracts are all different. You can fill us in. But if I'm not mistaken i might use the wrong wording here but robert williams is like a poison pill exception would it be an arena's provision one of the two um yep is that right yeah so it, it's a little complicated because it, so i'll nerd out here for a minute I'll go, <laughs> go ahead man go it. ahead um poison pill doesn't actually that's not a terminology that exists in the collective bargaining agreement anywhere um it, it's been a term that we've all kind of gone to and it gets used uh it gets used to cover two different scenarios. Um, the, the first is uh, what, which is what Robert Williams is. It's, it's a trade restriction because of base year compensation and an extension. I just said a lot of words that people are probably like, I don't, what does that mean? Essentially I'll boil it down really easy because Robert Williams has an extension that is yet to kick in. That is a big enough raise. What happens is off of his extension, if Boston trades him anywhere on the Celtic side, he counts at this year's salary, which is about 3.6, 3.7 million for anybody else. It's $2.3 million that the team that's acquiring him. The reason they do this is you don't want teams signing guys to extensions and then immediately turning around and trading them. Um, that that's just not the way the league wants business done. If you're going to sign a guy, you better feel pretty good about that extension and you hang on to him. Now that gets eliminated and removed when we hit the off season. Then he just counts at the number, whatever his salary is. There's not that imbalance. So that's that poison pill. The other poison pill comes into play with a restricted free agent where if you're giving them a contract that is uh, X amount of size and there are certain type of free agent, you mentioned the arenas provision, if they're Gilbert arenas provision limited, what that means is you could take that contract and you can count it one of two ways. You can either say, we're going to go uh, new deal, little raise, big raise, a bigger number off the, the second year number being big, or we can say it's, I'm just making it up, but it's 10 million average salary a year. He's going to hit the books at 10 million per year. And that's the way you can build, build that up. That's the other thing. The poison pill uh, factors in it. So you just have to you know, decide which way you're going to, going to sign the guy and how you're going to have that, that land on your books. So that that's, it's a term that gets used to cover both of those, but that that's where that hits is with, with those uh, two scenarios there. And this is why people bring you on to shows to break it down. <laughs> like, do you know, <laughs> it makes sense. How do you feel about these three guys? You've put them as the hard to moves. And for anybody that wants to have really get into Keith's uh, train of thought, I will link the link to the article on the podcast and on the YouTube channel so you can kind of follow it along. So without having to paraphrase what you've wrote, how do you feel about these three guys as as, indi as individuals and part of a larger collective on the rotation? Yeah, you covered Marcus Smart. Why he's hard to move already? He's just he's kind of even if you don't like it, he's still kind of the heart and soul of the team. He, even if if people aren't a huge fan of him, you can't deny that they they there's just something he brings to the team. He's the closest thing they have to a captain um, on this team. And again, people will say, well, he shouldn't be, but the reality is he is, and and that's. That combined with he's I wrote it in the piece. I think he's a guy who's more valuable to Boston than he necessarily is to anybody else. And that makes him hard to trade as well, because other teams may look at him and be like, ah, shaky shooting guy who's not really a point guard, but isn't really a two guard, but is pretty good combo guard. Is that really worth, you know, high teens per year in salary? And that's where that gets a little tricky. Robert Williams, beyond the CBA stuff, he's turned into his next deal right now, provided he stays healthy, that's the only thing that will keep that from being an absolute steal of a contract. He just has become that good of a player on both ends of the floor and that important of a player uh, 
for the Celtics. So that makes him hard to trade beyond the whole CBA quirks. And then Josh Richardson, the tricky part is he's played really well for the Celtics. I think he's really kind of refound his, his game and what made him into a pretty good player. But the previous two stops, he was not good at all. So you could very easily see teams being like, uh, I'm going to trust what I saw over two full or full ish seasons. I, I always want to say full seasons and then remember all pandemic wiped out chunks of each of them, but two full ish seasons. I'm going to trust that over, you know, 40 good games with the Celtics or 50 good games by the time uh, we hit the trade deadline or whatever it is. So that's where that one can be a little tricky because it does have that extra year uh, on the books. Um, it could also be something where if a team believes in it, that's a little bit better because now you're not dealing with them being a free agent after the year and those kind of things. So it, that's just why those those three guys slotted in there for very different reasons. But I think they all fall in that same category. That's fair. And I, I think that the Josh Richardson one is something that I hadn't considered. You know, we get so sucked up in how a player is playing now for the team that he's on that you never envision a team being like, well, actually he was pretty bad for a while just because he's playing well. Now, sometimes you just fall onto a roster and things work and you end up having a good season. The Marcus Smart one, um, you know me, I'm not one to do fake trades. It's not really my forte, but I did postulate one on a YouTube episode a, a few days back. I bought it, uh, mentioned it to Bill. I think he mentioned it in our Slack channel as well. Um, I, I, I kind of threw a Marcus Smart for Terry Rozier straight up as a one-to-one -one trade for Charlotte, you know, terrible defensively. They could do with a little bit of a culture reset on that end of the floor. Rozier already knows how to play with Jason and Jalen. A little bit of scoring and he can facilitate as well as giving you a bit more size at the guard position. How, one, is that feasible? And two, do you think that would even be worth making a phone call about uh, it was just one that kind of came to me and i felt like it made sense for both sides but i've had people say no it's not going to work and other people be like actually yeah that's a good idea yeah it, it's funny when when it, the way i judge a trade idea is when uh, fans from both sides are telling you you're an idiot i think you feel like all right i probably hit it kind of well here with this um i i think it's for for me is i don't i I don't necessarily want another guy who needs the ball a lot um, in their in their hands, and I know that goes kind of contrary to what people feel about the Celtics right now. And I know people want this, you know, great organizing point guard and all that. And everybody says they need a Chris Paul type. Well, yeah, so do about twenty nine other teams, and Phoenix has him. Like he's Chris Paul. Like he's almost kind of at this point one of one as far as true old school traditional point guards go. Um, but if you were going to make a move and I don't want to put it this way, but just to make a move to change things up and it's not, I don't hate the idea because as you said, Rogier knows how to play. He's, he's gotten better without the ball, um, which he doesn't have it all the time. Cause uh, LaMelo has it quite a bit. Gordon Hayward has it quite a bit. They, they, they run some stuff on occasion now for um, uh, miles bridges. And then uh, uh, Kelly Uber, when he's in the game has it miles or excuse me, Mason Plumley uh, is a guy that runs some stuff through on occasion. So Rogier's done well. I'm um, adapting to playing off the ball. So I don't, I don't necessarily hate the idea. I, I, I think he's a little overrated as a defender. So I worry that you giving up an awful lot of, uh, of defensive versatility with Marcus smart that you wouldn't, get back enough offensive uh, boost and upgrade to, to balance it off. But it's one of those where I wouldn't, if that happened in real life, I wouldn't uh, immediately be, uh, you know, writing a couple thousand words about why, what a mistake it was. I, I don't think I'd go there. And you know, you've done a decent trade when Keith doesn't instantly <laughs> shoot it out of the sky. So I'll take that as a win. I'll take that as a win. I've seen that. Uh, well, the I've thing seen... is, you, you didn't you didn't say you know, hey, I want to trade uh, Bruno Fernando for Terry Rozier and then call it. You know, why, <laughs> why wouldn't that work? You know, and then you know, and that's where I could leave it as it doesn't work cap wise, and then people will still well, that's stupid. You know, you idiots. Like that's all right. Well, I mean, that's just math. It's not my fault. You you know, flunked math at some point. In life. So <laughs> you know, we've got a few and I want to do a fast fire round. So we'll kind of, uh, I'll kind of hunch these guys together because what we've got is we've got the hard to move vet. Everybody knows about Al Horford, where we are with yep. him. Um, I think that it's quite obvious now, unless you're trading one bad contract for another bad contract, it's not really, you kind of, you are where you are, right? I I've heard people say, well, hey, maybe you do Al Horford for Kevin Love, or maybe you do, 
Al Horford for John Wall, or you know, it's it's going to be that type of deal if I'm not mistaken. If you're trying to move off from Horford, would that be correct? Yeah, it very much feels that way. I think Al Horford has a little more value than people give him credit for, but I don't think his contract to player value is a positive. I think it is a negative. I don't think it's a huge negative, like say John Wall, where you know he just doesn't even play and hasn't really played now. But barring a, a you know brief appearance last year, um, we haven't seen him play in a few years. So I, it, but yeah, it's not you're you're not Al Horford is not going to be the centerpiece of any kind of amazing return unless he's in there strictly as a salary match in there, and you're plussing it up with picks or players or something on the other side. And that leaves us with the very tradable vets, as you've put them. And then the kids. So we can package all these together because these are what I would call your your core rotation all the way through to your end of bench, guys. You know, you're going to have your Dennis Schroeder is going to be in there along with your Romeo Langford, your Aaron Neesmith. And if, it, if there is going to be a fringe trade, as we would call it, it's going to be one or multiple of these two groups kind of amalgamated together in a deal. How do you... like? Okay, so I haven't asked you this, actually. Udoka's kind of got some heat for not really playing the young guys, right? Like Neesmith hasn't got a ton of time. Uh, Romeo Langford's all of a sudden found himself marginalized. Same with Peyton Pritchard. Do you think that he's just one of the coaches that genuinely prefer to coach veteran players? Or is there a world where he's kind of sending a message saying, I'm not going to play these guys, trade them for some people that fit my scheme? Or how, how, have, you, how have you seen and kind of compartmentalized Udoka's rotations with those young guys. Yeah, I think he tried to play those guys early on, and the team wasn't very good. I mean, they they, they have not played consistently well until really the last two weeks. In the last two weeks, they've really started to put together some some pretty good basketball. And and, and people will yell and scream about look at who it was against, but. They, they weren't beating those kind of teams earlier in the year. So, you know, I mean, it's it's that. And I think the Celtics are in a position where this all goes back to, to the timing for me of these next three weeks are we're going to figure out who we are and figure out our path forward. And I think Ime Udoka is looking at it and saying, we can win if I don't play those guys because I can trust Tatum, Brown, Horford, Williams, Smart, Schroeder, Grant, and Richardson. And if I need to, I'll throw uh, Ennis out there for a few minutes. If I need to, I'll throw Pritchard out there, maybe Langford and Smith, but they're going to get minimal time at best. I've got my kind of eight, nine guys. Here we go. This is what it is. And I think what's happened is while people are yelling and screaming about he's not playing these guys, they're winning games. <laughs> So it becomes a trade-off, right? Do you want to see the kids play and not win games or do you want to win games? I, I know what the real answer is. We want to see the kids play and win games, but that wasn't happening. So I think what Ime has done is until there's an organizational shift to, all right, the season's lost where we're going to just kind of do, do, you know, we're going to let it become what it becomes the rest of the way. I think, sorry, the pup is visiting. <laughs> so that's, that's uh, the older dog. She, she had to come say hi. And now the little guy is uh, looking in here as well. Um, <laughs> when there's an organizational shift of, all right, you know what? This year is what it is. However it falls out, it falls out. The kids are going to play and they're going to play a whole bunch down, down the stretch. If it is a, no, hey, we really think we can still make a run and, and push up into the top six and make a playoff run. The kids just aren't going to play much, and that's that's I just think where the reality of it is right now. They they didn't do enough with the minutes they got to continue to earn getting that, and their value super low as a result, right? So it's going to be really hard to find a trade that works for both sides that sure. actually improves what you've already got in in the tank. Yeah, and I'll say on that too. I don't want anybody to to say their value is low because Ime is not playing them. Their value is low because they haven't earned the minutes. It's not. It, this is not an Ime Udoka thing. These guys, you know, Romeo Langford. Every you know, feels like every time it's like, hey, Romeo's put together a good couple good games. He's out of the lineup for a week. Uh, Aaron Neesmith is. It's more game to game. Sometimes 
in game, it's like, hey, that that first stint from Aaron Neesmith was pretty good. And then his next one is, oh my gosh, that was a complete disaster. And then Peyton Pritchard has shown, you, you know, you maybe everybody doesn't know. I think everybody follows me enough to know. I would rather give Peyton Pritchard every single minute he could handle versus ever see Dennis Schroeder play another second for the Celtics. I'm just oh, not a Dennis Schroeder guy. Um, but I understand why he is going with Dennis Schroeder because at least you know what you have there versus Pritchard at the beginning of the year. He was not good at all. I mean, just was not figuring out. Yeah. And maybe there's something to, they didn't have enough time. They didn't have enough time to get a rhythm going, but the reality is, you know, these guys did not come in and did demand that they play. And for everybody who says, well, it's because of this and that Grant Williams got minutes and took advantage and has proven I need to be a part of the every night rotation. I'm good for 15 to 30 minutes, whatever you need of me. I'm going to be there. I'm going to produce. I'm going to do that. And you know what? He's the same age as those other three guys. So they're right there. There's, there's no reason why they couldn't have taken the same opportunity. Grant Williams had seized it and run with it. And the reality is they just didn't do it. And that's, it's not the end of the world because they're young and they're going to figure stuff out or they're not. But as long as you, if you're of the camp of, I want the Celtics to win games and try to, you know, be the best team they can, then you have to be okay with these guys not playing. And that's, I mean, that's where it's really tough though, right? Like it, I find it's always tougher to like n- move on from rooting for one of the young guys to crack a rotation than it is from somebody like a Josh Richardson. Like if, we, if, if Josh Richardson hadn't played the way he's played this year and he was glued to the bench, I don't think anyone would bat an eyelid because he's not somebody that you've drafted and you've invested that time to kind of learn what the player was like in college and to really start rooting for him. You know, the team's investing money in their development. It feels like you're just more connected when it's that type of scenario. I was on mute. Uh, <laughs> what I was saying is look at Wancho. Yeah. He doesn't play and no one really cares. No one's upset because he's not playing. I mean, I'm sure there's some Wancho stands out there that are like, he needs to play. He's going to unlock everything. And the reality is every time we see him play, that's the exact opposite. But yeah, yeah you are much more attached to your kids. I, I have the theory of they, they become our guys. And for me, the ultimate our guy over this kind of iteration of the Celtics it was Avery Bradley. Avery Bradley came in as a lightly regarded uh, late first round pick. Didn't do too much his first couple years. And then he started taking off. And then under Brad Stevens that uh, year when they made that East finals run and everybody's like, how did this happen? This team is in the East finals. And unfortunately it got hurt and was out. That was really the year where it was like, Avery Bradley's our guy, man. And remember, yeah. I will, I'll never forget against that Cleveland team. He hit a, he had a game winner in the playoffs and, and it was like, it might've been the only game they won in that East finals that year against Cleveland. But it was like, that's what a moment, right? That's a B that's our guy. And then months later he was chipped off to the Detroit Pistons as they cleared cap space for Gordon Hayward and picked up Kyrie and all the other things they did. But the, that's what you want, right? You want those guys to become that. The reality though is it's, do you want to just wait around on maybe that happens or do you want to see the team win games? And, and I think the vast majority of people want to see the team win until it's very clear of, all right, we've completely changed directions. And that's why, again, not to be a broken record, but I think these next three weeks are so important because it really becomes the, all right, let's, uh, let's, let's find out what we've got. If we're not there, I do think they're going to pivot and very much say, all right, you may Langford, Neesmith, Pritchard, they all got to play. They they and they've got to play. You know, 15, 25 minutes a night at least. Uh, and go and and I think think you'll you'll see that's how it goes. It'll be you know they'll be out there very regularly and guys like uh, Richardson, Schroeder, uh, NS Freedom that maybe aren't part of the long term plans. They just kind of fall by the wayside. And that's going to be an interesting kind of way to see it as well because it always comes back to. It, it brings us back to the top of the show, right? Like if it's not going to be that year and you do have to move into a development, then you're further along on the clock than what you would have been if it was a year where you actually had a little bit of tangible success. What I want to do now, I know that we're going to, I want to wrap up shortly. So 
I want to kind of do not a rapid fire because I've run out of names in like two minutes because there's very few who I think are legit. So I was thinking maybe I could give you two or three names. You tell me whether you think they're one attainable, two realistic, and three if they would fit. And then you give me a couple of names just so everybody's got an idea of realistic targets. And then we'll let you uh, carry on with your lovely day. Yeah, so perfect. the names I've got, and this is like, you know, Tyus Jones is a name that I've been quite big on as a backup point guard. Um, super high IQ playmaker, doesn't really require the ball too much, and is a pass first guy that's going to cost you absolutely at the floor compared to a, another pass first point guard around the league. So I like the name Tyus Jones. Uh, I've got Norman Powell if things continue to go south in Portland. I think if you need shooting and you need uh, pals on a decent length contract, it just makes sense for Boston to at least um, kick the tires on, an, on a possibility there. And then again in Portland, um, Robert Covington and Yusuf Nurkic. Those are the four names I'm really heavily expecting Portland to just implode. Um, do any of those make sense? Would you see any of those attainable? Yeah, I think all four of them in their own ways make sense and i think all four are fairly attainable as well um starting with tyus jones i think uh that would have to be a decision of what do you want to do with him beyond this season because i believe he's a free agent next year i i think i let me i, I should have pulled it up and looked while you were talking uh yeah, he's a expiring contract. He'll be a free agent. So I think what you have to do with a guy like Tyus Jones is, or what's the long term plan? Are we going to resign him? Not they, you don't want to say no matter what because if somebody gets stupid and says here's twenty million a year, like yeah, you're you know clearly not going to go there. But if it's hey, all things being equal, we'll, we'll give him you know the money he wants and keep him around. Absolutely, you you could invest in a guy like that. I feel similarly about Covington and Nurkic both because they're also in similar type positions where they're expiring contracts, and you got to kind of look at it and say, all right, where are we going? Now a big chunk of that becomes what's going out on on the other side right because i'm not bringing in tyus jones if i'm still gonna have marcus smart and dennis schroeder because there's just you can't play all three of those guys you know so you got to move one of them uh, i don't have a ton of interest in bringing in nurkic if horford and the two williamses are still the, my main uh big man rotation because i just don't know that you need another big in there as part part of that uh, Covington a little bit different because he's kind of more forward size. He's played, you know, three, four, five in, in his career. Probably he's more three, four. And I, people went a little far with, he played center for the Rockets. Well, that was a goofy, you know, construction of a roster. And <laughs> yeah, it's I like, I think everybody's, you know, now deciding that Evan Mobley's really a three and maybe could be a two. And it's like, what are we doing? Like, I mean, it's working, but that's a goofy roster construction that works for, you know, the vast majority of teams. Uh, Evan Mobley is a four and gets Guess what he's a damn good four and let's just leave it at that um but so covington that one again makes a little bit more sense because i think that is a need for the celtics is is a three four kind of guy who can yeah. can do some stuff and shoot um he's also a defender the challenge with covington is he hasn't been the same player over the last few years that i think people really uh think he he was he's really kind of slipped defensively he's not what he once was um with that so yeah so that one gets a little 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 trickier on that side and then um who is the oh norman powell norman powell i kind of like that one from the standpoint of that comes with he signed longer so I think that part I do like. Um, he clearly has played with two guys who have the ball a lot in Lillard and McCollum. So I think he's used to that. Uh, for everybody who might say, well, yeah, but he's only ever played with one of those guys at a time. Nope. They were playing three guard lineups with all three of them out there. And his time in Toronto, he was out there with guys who had the ball quite a bit, uh, whether in his early years, it was uh, Lowry and DeRozan. Then it became Lowry and Kawhi. Then it became you know, Lowry and Siakam and Fred Van Vliet, you know, past Powell, but Powell still hung in there and was a very productive player. So I, I do kind of like that one um, in that type of scenario, though, I'd have to probably see Josh Richardson moving out just because, they, there's too much overlap there. I don't know yeah. how you find minutes for, for both of them uh, in a rotation where you really probably only one of them fits ideally, but you know, all four, you know, very reasonable guys that, that I think uh, could make sense. Um, now, if you pivot, Powell maybe makes sense. The other three, no, I'd pass. I wouldn't um, do that. Just give the minutes to Pritchard Langford and e. Smith and just move on. Powell maybe just cause he signed longer term. 
Yeah, and I just feel like even if even if it didn't manifest into success this year with Powell, he's still like he looks like he could be a very valuable piece to the exactly. roster, especially yeah. when you're so starved of shooting. So yeah. let's um, if you've got any names that you've kind of been looking for a lens at, really thinking, man, this guy could come in and really change the way this team plays, or really just alter the rotation in a positive way. Who would they be? Yeah, I think the one guy, and it feels like we're in year umpteen of saying, let's go get Harrison Barnes, right? I just, I, I think Harrison Barnes fits what the Celtics need right now. He's basically, he would come in and kind of sort of take Grant Williams' role as a, um, you know, uh, a four, um, you know, who can play with both Horford and Robert Williams. Um, but he also has the benefit of he can play the three if you wanted to run him out there when you have two bigs on the floor. Um, they don't have a player like that right now on the roster. I mean, that's kind of Jason Tatum, right? And and that's, you know, so he becomes Tatum's, you know, super duper high end backup with also Barnes can play alongside Tatum. And you, you can envision closing lineups of something like, you know, Robert Williams, Barnes, Tatum, Jalen Brown, and then, you know, a point guard of, you know, choosing probably Marcus Smart because you've got enough offense and defense out there. So getting him is a little harder, right? That's going to probably have to because you're not, you know, it's let's be realistic. You're probably not selling the Kings on a Al Horford package unless you really plussed it up. But if you wanted to, you could get there pretty easily if you did like Josh Richardson and one of the kids, you know, maybe, maybe Romeo Langford. The, the thing I think you're looking at with Langford too is. Are we signing Langford to a contract extension this summer? What does that look like? Are we going to let it play out another year and risk losing them for really nothing in the offseason? You, you got to be uh, kind of cautious on that. But Harrison Barnes is number one on my list. Slightly behind him, similar-ish player. I just think worse and a worse fit is Jeremy Grant. Um, I, not, not, you know, I, I like Jeremy Grant. I just think Harrison Barnes uh, gives this team a little bit more of what they need. And then if you wanted to go um, – you know, in a slightly different direction. You really wanted to say, all right, hey, let's try to really kind of do something and really plus up. John Collins seems like maybe he's available from the Hawks as they kind of look like they reset. And that one might be where, all right, well, Al Horford has to go to be the reasonable salary match, but we're going to give you picks. We're going to give you, you know, kids. We're going to, you know, kind of whatever you want with the idea of, you know, hey, if we come out of this on the backside with, Robert Williams, John Collins, Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, and Marcus Smart, we're looking pretty pretty solid. So those, those are the kind of guys I would look at. And then there's a million other smaller, uh, you know, options I kind of, that that would make sense. I, you know, Norman Powell will be a guy on my list uh, when I write about you know what are the Trailblazers doing and where are they going with things um, there. And then you know Terrence Ross uh, from the Magic is a guy who could maybe help. I I just I I don't know does. You know, again, is he going to play over Josh Richardson and play better than Josh Richardson? You know, where does it go from from there? And then, you know, for me, it becomes almost the bigger question is we're getting one of these guys. What's going out on the other side and how are we really rebalancing thing or things around Tatum and Brown? I, I like um, Harrison Barnes. There's not many. There's not many players out there whose coaching staff needs to tell them to shoot more. <laughs> and I think that I think that tells you everything yeah. you need to know about the type of player he is. I think you know what's funny. If, if sorry to interrupt you, but I think, think this is a really good point. Ed, someone tell me about Harrison Barnes. If you need him to be your third best player, he, he's happy to step up and be your third best player. If you need him to be your sixth or seventh best player, he's perfectly happy to be your sixth or seventh best <laughs> player. Like he's just the kind of guy who just wants to win. He works really hard. Uh, great, great teammate. I've never, I've yet to talk to anybody who, who kind of dislikes him and, and talk about a guy who has that uh, supporting uh, player on championship team experience. He's got that in droves from his early years with the Warriors. So, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of uh, Harrison Barnes and what he could bring to to the Celtics. Yeah, I'm all in. Um, I also think that you know anyone listening here, you're going to get a lot of tweets tomorrow about John Collins after what you've just said. Um, so I, I apologize for that. Event. Fan. Yeah, I like John Collins. I think he makes complete sense. Okay, so. I promised everybody to get a trade primer. I think that um, you've done a fantastic job of giving us a trade primer. Again, I will link Keith's original article into the podcast, into the YouTube channel. I'm also going to link Keith's um, YouTube channel into the podcast and onto the YouTube description of the channel that this podcast goes on to as well, because he's absolutely crushing it over there. He's at, um, in fact, it's growing rapidly. So kudos on that too, actually. Thank um, you. 
thank you for joining us. Everybody, make sure to read Keith Smith wherever he puts stuff out. And if you ever need cap stuff, sp uh, is it Spot Track or Spot Track? Uh, you're you're right uh, on the first one, Spot Track. Spot Track. So make sure to go check check out Keith's work on Spot Track. As usual, make sure you leave that five star review. You can now do so on Spotify. Also, they've added the feature, which is fantastic. And make sure you tell your Uber driver, your Uber Eats delivery driver, your hairdresser, your Solanius, whoever sells you your boat. So if you're renting a boat or buying a boat at the weekend to listen to the Celtics Pod podcast. We'll catch you, everybody, on Monday. Keith, thank you again, man. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you for having me.